Okay, um, our next presentation will be about uh, the credit market revolution from TradFi to DeFi. I welcome Darren Kamas from IPOR Labs. And, oh, yeah. Stage is yours. I need to adjust this a little downwards. Uh, all right. It's, I think it's good. Uh, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, my name is Darren Camus. Uh, I'm the CEO of iPOR Labs. Uh, I've been building in the space since 2011. So I'm presenting you from LIBOR to iPOR, TradFi to DeFi credit market evolution. So if you guys are in this room, uh, you know maybe a little bit about what DeFi is, decentralized finance, describing financial applications that you can build on blockchain. You can think of it as putting together a couple of snippets of code to form a simple application, or these other small applications into a larger application. Uh, when we say TradFi, if you guys work in traditional finance or what you guys might know as finance, that's what we refer, refer to as TradFi. So the difference between uh, TradFi and DeFi, 11 years in TradFi, you may be up for a managing director. In DeFi, well, you may be dead. Okay, so before we, def uh, before we start this, let's define something as total value locked in DeFi. So total value locked refers to the essentially the volume of assets that is deposited into a DeFi protocol. So typically in, uh, in DeFi, if, if we're talking about the, the uh, credit markets, we're talking about assets that are essentially deposited and they're deposited as collateral. So you typically, uh, let, let's just talk about Ethereum layer one right now. So it might be ETH, it might be an ERC20 token, which represents another asset. And these are typically deposited as collateral to borrow to receive stablecoin. So it's grown by orders of magnitude in the last four years. Uh, you know, starting 2020 up at 10 billion. Now we're talking about $40 billion in assets locked into DeFi credit protocols alone. So if we look at this and compare it to a bit of the uh, traditional financial markets, uh, the credit markets in DeFi, they're very short term. Actually, uh, most of them lack term structure. If we talk about the shortest uh, DeFi loan, we're talking about maybe a single Ethereum block, which is about 13.3 seconds. So you can imagine that this is not a, maybe a good market structure if you're taking a 30-year uh, mortgage, but they're very liquid and a, uh, you know, a growing market. So if we want to see this market actually, ex uh, let's say, mature, uh, we need to extend the maturities and the, uh, the term structures on these, on these instruments. And so we think that this, uh, this pyramid of essentially you know, where, where the value is accrued will start to invert. Well, we'll see more action on the, uh, on the uh, fixed income instruments and then this value accrual in the interest rate derivatives. Okay, so the basic money market mechanism is kind of what I explained before. It's this TVL that's posted. So you might post a crypto asset like Ethereum and you post typically around 150% of the amount that you want to borrow. So this is very good if you have lots of liquidity, but you know, if you go to a bank and say, okay, you need to deposit one and a half times the house to borrow the money to buy the house, it's obviously not capital efficient. Uh, but one of the reasons that this structure exists is because of very simple construction. If you can only partially collateralize and borrow the stablecoin, you can use the stablecoin to buy the asset, the asset to rehypothecate infinitely, and this presents structural risk. So this is actually a technical limitation on these markets. Uh, but we do have a, let's say, a traditional finance proxy to this, which is securities lending, where you can take a security, you can pledge it, and you can borrow against it, say, without effectuating a capital gains, uh, capital gains movement. Uh, so what's important to understand is this is a peer-to-pool model. What does that mean? So the stablecoin depositors here, uh, they're decentralized. It might be anyone on the other side of the world that wants to put stablecoin into a pool. This is going to, into a software module, and then that is being lent out by another software module that governs it. And so, for example, if you want to borrow against this, you deposit your crypto as, as collateral, and then you can borrow stablecoin. Now, what happens if the collateral value drops near to the value of the loan? Well, you have these decentralized depositors that can actually take the instrument, they can liquidate it, 
which repays the lender automatically. And so this is a way that the protocol uh, prevents default risk. So this is a very interesting because you have this very strong decentralization factor where the pool is placed by decentralized depositors. We have these essentially decentralized uh, liquidators that are keeping it, uh, that are keeping the protocol uh, essentially liquid. And then if we define a risk as only default risk, this is essentially mitigates default risk. Of course, we're talking about very high levels of technological risk, of protocol risk. So remember, this is a very new, very experimental sector, so plan accordingly. Okay, so if we look at the DeFi credit markets, actually the vast majority is locked in these over-collateralized mechanisms. So we're talking about Aave and Compound on Ethereum layer one. Then we're talking about multiple orders of magnitude more, as you're talking about billions or tens of billions that are being borrowed on a daily basis. Uh, whereas if you say, let's say Avalanche, which is the third uh, blockchain in TVL, you have hundreds of millions that are being bo borrowed on, say, Trader Joe or Binky. But if we take some other credit models, we can talk about something like Goldfinch. So Goldfinch is maybe much more similar to a traditional securitization or credit risk scoring mechanism, where a company or a project or a protocol submits something like KYC documents, balance statements, and you have a group of decentralized auditors that essentially evaluate these documents, evaluate for credit risk, and then print an NFT, which serves as part, uh, part identity and part of a credit risk module. And so this is, again, replicating much more of the traditional flow, uh, whereas it's also, let's say, much more cumbersome than the over-collateralized, which is entirely permissionless. You can deposit assets and borrow against them immediately. Then you have a securitization process, let's say something like Centrifuge, which essentially takes, uh, let's call them physical world assets. So if you want to borrow against your house on chain, then you get a, a a securitization company such as Centrifuge, which issues the, off, uh, the asset on chain, and then you can borrow against it. Or you get some other innovative models like Fortunify, which is offering structured products. Let's say a basket of on chain assets and a basket of uh, securitized assets, and they issue a separate stable coin which has a diversified yield. So, this is not a comprehensive overview of the DeFi credit markets, it's just selected you know, for this talk. So if we talk about interest rates in DeFi, what are we talking about? Well, right here is a, is, this is a breakdown from both a, a mechanism used by Compound and Aave and most of the over-collateralized mechanisms. So it's a simple utilization rate. Cash borrowers over cash available. You find that number on the scale and that's the interest rate. So this is a very, it, it's, it's proven to be a very effective way to bootstrap a protocol, but I would argue that there are much better or maybe much more advanced interest rate models that have yet to be, uh, yet to be published, yet to be explored. Uh, so what does this cause? So if you, look on, uh, if you look on your right, you have a, a tweet by IPOR Labs showing a huge rate in the IPOR USDT index. So what's happening here is actually the USDT utilization rate on Aave it spiked from 89% to 91%, which sent the interest rate rising. So you have these huge rate spikes based on this very uh, simplistic bonding curve model. So that shows that we need this uh, LIBOR-like index, one, to show what's happening in, in the uh, interest rate markets on DeFi, and two, we need, uh, we need tools to actually hedge yourself against the risk. Okay, so going from the LIBOR to the IPOR, if we talk about LIBOR, besides being this interest rate benchmark, it's secondly most well known for the, uh, the collusion, the rate manipulation, right? And of course, uh, you know, the traders and the manipulators were the main benefactors of this. Uh, and one of the issues in the discontinuation of the LIBOR was the liquidity risk because you had multiple indices that were vying for essentially becoming the, the new de facto benchmark rate. So that is something that we actually embrace at IPOR. So we embrace the idea that this benchmark rate is essential to structure other credit products. One of the big things that we, that we disagree with is the manipulation part. And one of the things that blockchain gives us is it gives us these smart contracts that are auditable, transparent, adaptable, and modular. 
So when we're, when we're thinking about where do these benchmark rates to grow, go to grow up, we looked at the, uh, you know, the IPOR design and the calculation. And so similar to the LIBOR, it's based on, let's call them uh, you know, proxies to financial institutions, where these protocols such as Aave and Compound on Ethereum are similar to financial institutions in the fact that they're single protocols, so they may represent, let's say, one bank. But on the other hand, we have something like the BSBY, which is transaction and volume weighted. And instead of the BSBY, which only takes a subset of the transactions that go across the Bloomberg terminal, actually, because we have blockchain, we have this open, transparent dynamic where you can see all the, all the trades that are printed on chain in real time. So if you look behind, this is the IPOR, uh, or the interprotocol offered rate as the benchmark uh, index for DeFi. So we have IPOR USDC, IPOR USDT, and IPOR DAI. And they essentially have different rate behaviors, so we treat them as different currencies. So actually, you can see high volatility, but this is not some of the worst volatility. During DeFi summer, we saw rate spikes from 3% to 30% in a single day. So again, advantages that the IPOR has over the LIBOR, we get the survey of interest rates from DeFi protocols directly from the smart contracts, avoiding manipulation. So we get a volume-weighted on-chain uh, on market activity approach, and this is something that's governed by the DAO. So what happens when, let's say, a new protocol or a new de facto financial institution arises? How does this activity get introduced into the IPOR rates? Well, this is not a question that you have for me. It's a question that goes to decentralized governance in the future. Finally, it's published uh, based on the heartbeat methodology. So every certain time interval, every certain volatility jump, or every certain market action, such as an uh, IPOR interest rate derivative being taken. And this is really good for DeFi, because if we're looking at the LIBOR, which was published once a day, 11 a.m., British Standard Time, except for weekends and holidays, and you have an overnight rate, like the SOFOR, tell me what's overnight in DeFi? Tell me what country or city is at the heart of this DeFi market. So we get something that's published on chain in real time. And finally, again, it's adaptable modular construction and it's chain agnostic. So it can go to grow where these DeFi credit markets go. Other unique characteristics of DeFi, so you have a public good. So every time this gets printed on chain, uh, if you are a data provider, you can actually just go read the smart contract to understand what's the IPOR rate right now. So this is also a public good that we can kind of reconstruct the aggregation of value around the IPOR indices. So let's say if you're an NFT market that's trying to set a credit structure for an asset, can you point to the IPOR indices and uh, just quote an IPOR plus some basis point spread? And so this is a way that this, uh, this public good, uh, you know, it presents an open, an open playground for other people to play in this DeFi credit market. Again, it's modular and adaptable, so this can go very easily cross-chain. So it's agnostic to a single blockchain, but it's a long play into the DeFi credit markets. And finally, composability. So we often talk about DeFi as money Legos. You take a couple of different modules and you piece them together to make a financial instrument. Well, you can also take multiple financial instruments and piece them together to make something else. And so we'll go into that just a little bit later. So we took this idea of composability and we created the IPOR interest rate swap. So the IPOR interest rate swap is based on this IPOR rate. But instead of a typical swap, which has two counterparts, we switched out one of those parts and put in the passive liquidity pool. So the passive liquidity pool is always there to underwrite a derivative instrument. And then we use this on-chain piece, which is called the AMM, or the Automated Market Maker. And for example, in the IPOR interest rate swap, the Automated Market Maker is based on a couple well-known quant models, such as whole white, which is the de facto standard for interest rates, and something like the Jump Diffusion model, which is used to price extremely volatile interest rate models. And so this AMM takes in uh, volume on long and short, it takes risk exposure by the pool, it takes volatility, and it takes this reversion to the mean into consideration when pricing the instruments for the taker, so that there is always an instrument that can be taken against the pool while there's liquidity. 
And so this is some way that we can actually adapt this instrument to on-chain. We can make it efficient enough. Uh, the AMM essentially prices risk for both parties, and once it's printed on-chain, then it automatically it self-executes. So, of course, derivatives, uh, IPOR derivatives or any other derivatives, you can use them, for example, to hedge if you're a stablecoin borrower, if you're a stablecoin lender. Uh, you can use them to arbitrage, so you see this uh, divergence between different stablecoins. Uh, maybe you can capture this arbitrage opportunity borrowing one and lending the other and taking pay fixed and receive fixed across those two contracts. Of course, you can also take a directional position. And one thing to note, these are, uh, these are single asset uh, examples. So they're, they're priced in USDT, USDC, or DAI. OK, so from a business model and value capture perspective, uh, obviously the interest, uh, the, the IPOR rates are being synced directly from the smart contracts of the primary markets. Also, if you're a data provider, you can get the IPOR index in one of two ways. Either one, you get the real-time data which is being uh, synced on the back end by multiple providers, or you can take it right off of the off-chain component. And this off-chain, uh, sorry, this on-chain component, which is an oracle, and that oracle is first going to be printed to Ethereum and then across multiple chains. And then finally, you have the interest rate derivatives, which are built that can be taken as a hedge, for example, against your primary market uh, exposure. But if we're looking at these credit markets as a software stack, IPOR has one simple mission, to become the base of the decentralized credit markets. So of course we have the base, which is the rates. And the rates, this is why we refer to IPOR as the heartbeat of DeFi, because the credit rates, the interest rates, are the beating heart of every financial market. Especially given that it's based on utility, as the rates go up, that means the heartbeat is going faster. You have a lot more debt taking in this, in this situation. But you can use these, uh, let's say, these interest rate derivatives that are based on the IPOR uh, to actually hedge your primary uh, market exposure. But you can also bring them together in one single call to create something like you know, uh, a, a, a money market hedge fund. Or larger structured products or larger structured rate products. And so this is where we believe that the market will go over the long term as we start extending the maturities in these different debt instruments. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the team that's building the IPOR protocol. So again, I've been building products in, uh, in the crypto and blockchain space since 2011. Uh, my CSO, he's been the past five years across investment banking, uh, derivatives exchanges, and also venture capital. Uh, our CMO is the meme master, Passy T, uh, on crypto Twitter. And you guys may know uh, Sergey Stein. He's our uh, head of institutional business development. Uh, and so he'll be out by our booth later. You can find him or I. Uh, we have uh, some shadowy super coders uh, that have a background in enterprise software uh, development. So that means 15 years building scalable, secure infrastructure for banking, for payments, for insurance. And then, of course, the core of this is our quant team, uh, headed by Mao Hernandez, a PhD in computer science. Uh, he's built a derivatives exchange himself. And uh, we have two, actually, quants that have over 20 years uh, as, as quantitative engineers, the vast majority in, uh, in fixed income. So finally, if you're an institution in here, if you're a data provider, if you want to get access to the API data for IPOR, uh, if you're interested in getting the monthly reporting, or also we're offering white label research provided by our quant team, uh, please visit more about us. You can go uh, learn more at IPOR.io. Write us at info at IPOR.io about the API data, and you can find out more by following us on Twitter, IPOR underscore .io. Thank you very much.